Welcome to the Second Drafts Podcast, everything you need to write, edit, and publish your way. I'm Jeremy. And I'm EJ. And today on Second Drafts, we'll be talking about why people write fiction versus nonfiction. Uh, but first off, before we get into that topic, uh, we got a little bit of uh, news from the writing world. In this case, it's a little bit older. It has been out for a little while there. But I thought uh, it would be interesting to talk about it on our second podcast here uh, relating to Kindle Scout. Uh, So uh, before Kindle Scout was uh, actually just for the U.S. only, and it's recently been expanded to uh, international authors, which probably more so affects me and you, EJ, than Mm. anyone else there. Definitely. Uh, so, uh, you, are you familiar with Kindle Scout? Do you uh, want to explain it to our listeners, or shall I? Um, sure, I can explain it. Uh, Kindle Scout is a program that is run by Amazon, actually. And the, I think they're trying to crowdsource um, info about the market, about what the market wants. So, for an author, you can submit your book. Kindle Scout, and it takes about 45 days, I think, where they will put your book available in a catalog, and then readers can browse and see what books they find interesting and would like to see published. And if enough people vote for you, if you can put it that way, um, you'll, you, you know, you have the chance to end up with a publishing contract from Amazon, which is, uh, of course, it's not a sure thing. But it looks to be some some pretty decent terms, you know. It's, there's thousand five hundred dollars in advance, mm-hmm. and about fifty percent royalties, which you might notice is a bit, a little bit worse off than what you would get self-publishing, which is usually seventy percent, depending on how you price. Yeah. But I think it's, you know, the advantages are maybe a bit better. Because you you do get some benefit from Amazon's marketing engine, I would expect, mm-hmm. and mm, and I mean you do get that advance. So <laughs> yeah, and I mean fifty percent is still going to be better than uh, going with a traditional <laughs> publishing route for sure. Quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. So As Kindle well. Kindle Scout is definitely something that I've been interested in, um, and. I find it interesting as well, like uh, we definitely mentioned that the uh, social media side of things basically would kind of tie in with that, but it's not the end-all be-all because the Amazon editors uh, would also have a say in that as well, uh, which is definitely so, better. So people who... Uh, so instead of the, the person with the biggest uh, following, the yeah. biggest fan base, uh, you, you know, you get it a bit mitigated. So in the end, I think they'll still decide on merit, which which would be nice. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it opening up there to international, like uh, us, uh, me in Canada and you in South Africa, there uh, definitely bodes well for some of their other things, like um, the ACX Audiobook Creation Exchange, which ties in with Audible dot com. Uh, yes. Currently, it's only for like the U.S. and uh, a couple other places, I think, as well, but uh, not Canada and not <laughs> South Africa. <laughs> Certainly not South Africa. And uh, it's so odd to news. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's definitely good news, and I just I still find it really odd why at least Canada. I mean, like South Africa. I mean, come on, that's that's <laughs> way out there. Wow. Gee, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> No, but, but I wondered the same thing. I was I was pretty sure um, when I asked you that you would say, "Oh, sure, you you know you guys have ACX available," and it turns out you don't. It's it's really just the US, which is which is odd, because I mean th- this company, I mean Audible ACX, it's all affiliated with Amazon, and we know that Amazon can do international uh, trading and payments, or it's mm-hmm. all they do almost. Um, so I'm just wondering why. Uh, has ACX taken so long or Kindle Scout even yeah it's definitely weird and uh, if anyone has been paying attention to the YouTube channel there uh, or the blog 
Uh, I posted a video there basically talking about uh, the audiobook creation exchange. Uh, hopefully that should be up now. Uh, and how I uh, contacted them. And basically what they said to me was that I need to have uh, at least six books before they would consider me uh, for an international partnership. Uh, so I, I, again, I still they don't... They don't ask for much, do they? Yeah. <laughs> so at the moment, the only thing that uh, you or I or any other international people would be able to do would be to go to like an aggregate site. Uh, the only one that I'm familiar with for audiobook side of things is uh, called Authors Republic. And um, they... They have audiobook, uh, audiobooks with a bunch of different ones, Audible included, iTunes, Barnes and Noble, uh, other ones that I've never heard of, like Hoopla. I don't uh, what what's Hoopla. <laughs> I have no idea. We can take a look. Hoopla. It's hooplaDigital.com. We can see what that is. I took a look at the website uh, for Authors Republic. It looks looks interesting. It looks like it uh, could be the thing we need. Mm -hmm. And uh, I see they've also got an app called Recordio that helps you to record your uh, audiobook, well, yourself if you would like, I suppose, or to get a narrator. That looks to be interesting. I might actually write up a review of that app sometime <laughs> down the line. I wouldn't... I wonder if that's any better than uh, what we're currently using, though, Audacity. <laughs> I wonder. Hoopla looks to be, yes, an audiobook website. I, it's a very minimalist site. I'm <laughs> unable to see whether they're affiliated with anyone we would know. <laughs> Probably so not. <laughs> App Store app, Google Play app, and for Kindle Fire, so they do seem to be connected. Definitely can expand the reach there of the uh, books as mm. well. Indeed. But uh, that's all that I wanted to talk about there with that. So I guess we'll just move on to our next topic there. So the main topic today, uh, nonfiction or fiction. Uh, basically, we're talking about which would be the best option for writing. So uh, I know personally with both of us, we're strictly fiction at the moment. And, uh, are you interested in nonfiction at all, Ethan? Or in writing specifically, I'm guessing, not reading. <laughs> yeah. Um, for writing, I think at the moment not so much. But I mean, you know, I do edit uh, manuscripts for people, and there's a lot of knowledge that kind of gets generated that way. So I wouldn't mind uh, you know, producing a, a non-fiction book at some point, maybe related to editing, maybe related to language, grammar, uh, things like that. It might, might be something I could look at. Well, yeah, you could even do one of those uh, how-to books, like maybe uh, how to uh, edit your book on your own, something like that. Mm, <laughs> definitely. I, I'd have to compete with the likes of James Scott Bell, of course, but uh, <laughs> I can always give it a shot. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, from uh, my research there, uh, what everyone seems to say is that nonfiction, uh, at least when you're on our level, uh, relatively unknown, uh, nonfiction can get you more money. And whereas fiction, uh, maybe only when you're really... Uh, big name like Stephen King and stuff like that, you would be getting a lot more money than you could with nonfiction, say. Mm. So it, it does scale, maybe, and it does flip around at some point during the middle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think part of it is, you know, people maybe, maybe looking at it this way treats writing just like writing, as if there's nothing unique about the way you write or the things you want to write. So I think one should really break it down and look at... I mean, not everyone's going to want to write non-fiction, and not everyone's going to want to write fiction. So there's really particular cases where the one will tend to become more useful to you as an author. Mm -hmm. um, like, for instance, 
non-fiction is, look, I think with the, the income that you just mentioned, sure, I think it's easy to, easier to sell short articles, say, to magazines, to blogs, to, there are, there's quite a market, I think, for short non-fiction mm -hmm. articles and the like. Um, where short fiction, of course, we know that tends to yeah, not work out so uh, well, I think, in terms of sales, if you don't have the, how do we say, the fan base to back it up. Well, and yeah, no. and even uh, trying to get those non-fiction things into, I mean, uh, the fiction uh, products into, say, a newspaper and stuff like that, uh, one thing that I read uh, basically said that you're 10 times more likely to get into Harvard than uh, you would be to be able to uh, get a fiction, like a short fiction, into uh, some sort of an article or... Like a literary magazine. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I've heard those are incredibly difficult to get into, <laughs> which, is, which is kind of the point. Um, <laughs> but... I think also there's a you know there's a functional uh, aspect of nonfiction where um, if you have useful knowledge like I just mentioned with the, the editing, I think if you if you gather knowledge and if you have some unique knowledge that you might want to share with people, I think nonfiction will obviously serve you much better. Uh, you know you can write a book on how to write a book or how to combat addiction, how to raise a child. Mm -hmm. to grow prize-winning pumpkins yeah. uh, all these <laughs> all these you know th this kind of domain specific knowledge that you've got um, that are those are good topics I think for nonfiction and but not everyone has that you know some people have more this general feeling about a story they want to tell some drama they want to show and of course that's going to be a whole different thing these domains that you can write in, they're not all going to serve equally uh, all your goals, depending on what you want to do with your with your writing. Yeah, and at least uh, from what I'm thinking of, when I think of nonfiction, I think more of how-tos and uh, that sort of uh, factual uh, news gathering almost. Not to say that journalism is easy, but I think it certainly is a little bit easier than in writing fiction. Uh, you're not, you're not as, like you're a little bit more constrained and sometimes that's more of a good thing. Like you have uh, certain limitations that you have to work with and, you know, there's always those uh, psychology studies about too much choice. Uh, so I think that kind of helps out with the nonfiction side of things. You don't really have much leeway, so... Like it, it might be easier to put it together. Do you, maybe I'm wrong on that. What do you feel? I agree. Um, writing fiction, I think decision fatigue sets in so quickly. <laughs> uh, just, uh, I sometimes find myself paralyzed by all the choice in front of me uh, in how to present a story, how to write it, style, narrative, tone, mood, all these things. It's just too much and sometimes I kind of wish that I had you know just an actual factual news story to report on so that I can just but I think it might not be completely fair to call this uh, easier um, I think writing in general is, 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 is quite a hard thing it's it's not an easy thing uh, fiction or non-fiction I think maybe there are different kinds of difficulty maybe. Mm -hmm. well like definitely uh, like I'm just more on the end of the how-tos, like definitely with the uh, non-fiction on uh, like autobiography, uh, autobiographical style, that sort of thing. I feel that that uh, you would have to definitely take that sort of those things from fiction, like you have to kind of expand and just try and uh, think about the the feelings of the moment and stuff like that and express that on paper. Um, I think you had mentioned uh, before when we were talking about it there about creative nonfiction. So uh, taking those 
fictional techniques and adding that as a narrative to factual information. Yes, this is this is quite a, a I think it's a growing sense among nonfiction writers that you know, in order to get through to people, even if you're writing about dry, boring facts, for instance, uh, to get through to people, you still sometimes have to tell a story. People respond to stories. I think perhaps that's what's driving uh, this thing we're seeing, where even your nonfiction is starting to, uh, you know, have story elements to them, where you know we call it creative nonfiction because you're using some of your techniques and your embellishments uh, ultimately to serve uh, you know, a piece of work that is aimed at being factually accurate but it does use elements that are, might be considered embellishments yeah. well yeah I mean you have ones even uh, like the Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas mm -hmm. Hunter S. Thompson kind of uh, almost started that sort of a genre where it mixed fact and fiction together to make a more interesting story. Like, uh, you have definitely those moments where people have these autobiography uh, movies, like of Steve Jobs and stuff like that, mm -hmm. but I don't think you could ever uh, have a, an autobiographical movie get as big as, say, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas did for his movie with Johnny Depp there. So the the general appeal of that type of a story, mixing fact and fiction, uh, might even be the best of both worlds, as it were. <laughs> Definitely. But you have to be careful with that. I think uh, you mentioned before about uh, an author that kind of got in trouble there with mixing fiction and fact mm, indeed I think it's uh, it was on Oprah quite a while ago uh, James Frey for his book uh, A Million Little Pieces yeah and I mean he got accepted into you know he was his book was in Oprah's book club and it went to the top of the bestsellers list and it was just crazy this was way back in 2003 and um I don't know, at some point it came out that he embellished m large parts of the story and it was a book about uh, his fight against addiction, I think. Mm -hmm. And in the end, when it came out, I think it, 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 people went a bit crazy about it and uh, there was quite a bit of backlash. So I think that's that's another aspect of non-fiction that one has to keep in mind. Um, you, in writing non-fiction, you are saying that you're willing to take responsibility for the truth and the accuracy of the elements you put into your work and that's an important thing that people sometimes miss you you take on quite a lot of risk by presenting your story as non-fiction mm -hmm. because people are going to have certain expectations of it well like i gotta even wonder if there needs to be uh, a, a whole new genre for that type of a story because uh, I was just thinking that maybe even uh, like I'm sure that in some of our memories like we kind of almost shape our own memories and they might not even be accurate like uh, I remember this time that my parents uh, they we went on a trip to Florida to Disney World and <laughs> the, there was a recent game console that had been released. And as I remember, I begged my dad to get the console while we were even in Florida so that I could play it. And in my head, like, you know, I was being a brat child. And so that kind of like years down the road now, that's kind of how I thought of it had thought of that time that i was being like a real real big brat by like asking for this expensive game console while we were already at disney world <laughs> but then i asked my dad about it uh just a couple months ago and he said no we were actually planning on buying it when we were there so it's like 
our memory almost plays tricks on us too. So <laughs> like maybe they need to have their own kind of uh, area to put that in to say like, hey, these are uh, this is nonfiction sort of. But it's like this sort of <laughs> call it exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like the, these are based on my memories and like how I took the accounts of a situation. It may not be totally factually accurate. Yes. Well, funny you should mention that because that's exactly what James Frey used as his excuse. Mm -hmm. He he issued a statement saying this memoir is a combination of facts about my life and certain embellishments. It is a subjective truth altered by the mind of a recovering drug addict and alcoholic. So he very cleverly actually used the subject matter of the book to try to explain it away and say, well, of course, maybe I didn't remember it perfectly accurately. I mean, remember, I was uh, uh, you know, struggling with things at that time, which, you know, it, it, it may have worked as an excuse for some people, but from what I... Uh, understand it didn't work so well for everyone <laughs> do you think it maybe comes down to uh, perception of the genres themselves like when people look at nonfiction, they are looking for a specific uh, type of a story whereas of course fiction they're not looking for that do you think that is that what it comes down to I, I think so I think People have very particular expectations when it comes to nonfiction, and they they want to believe that this is a true story. That's that's part of the the appeal for them, I think. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a similar story about uh, there was an Australian book called Stolen Generations, and it was a it was a big hit, and it was about an Aboriginal woman called uh, Wanda Kumatri. I think I'm pronouncing that right, but probably not. Um, I think and I heard it turned of this. Out that, mm, and it turns out this book was written by a 40-something taxi driver from Sydney. <laughs> it's just, you know, a random guy that decided to write this, and the book did not find success when he tried to pass it off as, as, as fiction. So he ended up changing the whole pitch of it and uh, making it into a non-fiction, quote-unquote, and suddenly the book found success. So I definitely think there's this part of it where people, you know, they can read a story and in the back of their minds they can know, okay, this is just fiction, so it's kind of fake, so it's a good story, but, you know, it's just that. Mm -hmm. Where if they know that this, or at least they believe that this is a real story that actually happened, it kind of changes how they feel about it and how they respond to it. I do, th yeah. I do think that that was what he did was a little bit scammy. If I do remember uh, the story, I think he he actually submitted it to a publishing house specifically for Aboriginal people. He did. He did. So, <laughs> yeah. So it's like <laughs> it, it. I think it would be okay if if he had have gotten it maybe published uh, on a more broad scale, but that's specifically for people who are underrepresented and mm. want to get published like that certain publishing house was specifically for those people mm. so it's, i don't know that's that is quite scammy in my books <laughs> <laughs> definitely like i i'm not sure how some people are thinking about these things but you know <laughs> but yeah i definitely feel that uh perception of the uh, different uh, genres there is a little bit skewed as well like when you look at uh, fiction some people don't even read fiction because they don't feel that there's any literary merit to it how do you feel on that uh, are you saying people don't read fiction uh, for those reasons well like uh, there are certain people who say they don't read fiction for oh, that reason. Oh, definitely. Because they don't uh, feel that there's any literary they, merit to it. It's just made yeah, up. Yeah, they, they feel that, well, if it's just made up, then what's the point, really? Mm -hmm. But, I mean, I think that there's still value in stories because sometimes the things you want to share with people are, are greater, you know, than just 
how to or memoirs i mean real life does have its um, lessons and sometimes there are greater things there are morals and themes that you kind of want to try to present and these things don't work so well in non-fiction mm -hmm. um, i mean you can go ahead and tell someone uh, something but sometimes demonstrating it is much more effective and I think that's that's where fiction finds a good niche in um, you know <laughs> they always say to show rather than tell mm -hmm. and I think the distinction can be made here nonfiction excels at telling someone something you can tell them how to uh, do something how to use something how to be or become something but when it comes to fiction you have the opportunity to show people uh, something like a greater principle for instance an example that I sometimes uh, think of is you know a non-fiction article might tell the reader something like power corrupts and they could even let's say it's a news article they could even use examples from contemporary government to show you know there's corruption and that's how it works and you know they can go about proving a thesis which is which is good. It it'll work, but there's just something visceral about reading a book like Animal Farm, for instance, that goes ahead and it it demonstrates this principle in something that many people. I think initially, the publisher looked at George Orwell's book and they said, well, you know, they don't really know what they're going to do with it because it seems like a children's book. It's you know they they can't really <laughs> work with it, but. Turns out it's anything but a children's book. It was actually quite a, a powerful um, allegory. Mm -hmm. And I think you would never in non-fiction be able to have that kind of impact. I mean, years later, people who've read Animal Farm, they still remember that lesson. Uh, and the final lines of that book, it's, you know, it's something that sticks with you, and the lesson sticks with you. So I'm not sure how you would teach people that kind of a, you know, show them that kind of a lesson outside of fiction non-fiction what's that going to be a rule book is it going to be a <laughs> <laughs> history book a piece of legislature or something i don't know but yeah like i feel that uh people can read all they want about history and like you know the that whole thing about history repeating itself and those situations but the actual moral side of it like we can't it doesn't feel like we can really relate or empathize with history because we already have in mind uh, basically a real person. We can't put, put ourselves in their shoes as easily as we could say like a protagonist type character who might be very similar to us. And um, there was a study by... These psychologists, uh, Raymond Marr and uh, Keith Overly, uh, separate studies, I believe, but basically saying the same thing, that fiction helps with empathy. And uh, there is also uh, a judge, I'm just bringing it up here now, who uh, said that he reads fiction because he feels that... Um, Reading makes a judge capable of projecting himself into the lives of others, lives that have nothing in common with his own, even lives in completely different eras or cultures. And this empathy, this ability to envision the practical consequences of one's contemporaries of a law or a legal decision seems to me uh, to a crucial quality in a judge. So that yeah, empathy... I agree with that. Yeah. That's, that's pretty much what a judge is supposed to do, I suppose. Yeah, definitely. And just looking at history books and stuff like that, uh, probably would never have gotten that same value out of it. Mm. Yes, for sure. I mean, read a history book and read about this one dictator that exterminates, you know, millions of people uh, in his wars. And, you know, it's statistics. It's 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 nothing it's not much more at that point but you know tell someone a story about this one family that's trying to flee across the border and having to deal with 
you know, the, the soldiers of this dictator and getting shot at and getting tortured and getting, you know, you suddenly have something much more than that. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I definitely think uh, fiction has its place and it is very valuable. I would go so far as to say without fiction, very likely our civilization would not have, you know, been at the point where it is now. Yeah. And, like, there's still tons of uh, fiction books that have been around for generations. And, uh, I don't know, I would struggle to find a nonfiction book from the 1800s <laughs> nowadays. But <laughs> you ha you st we still have uh, Pride and Prejudice. And mm. people are still talking about that mm. these days. We still have Shakespeare. Yeah. <laughs> That's, you know... Um... I suppose, yeah, non-fiction, as you say, is very much tied to a certain environment, a certain set of things that are going on in the world at that point, where I think fiction can also, uh, you know, present a world as is, but I think fiction's focus is more on the inherent drama between people, and that's something that, strangely enough, it never changes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we change our trappings, we change our clothes, we change our technology, but, you know, the interhuman relationships, interpersonal relationships, we, ne we don't really change those. Those are pretty much the same as they've always been. Yeah, and you could even, you could still have a story that says the same things, but if you trap it in its own time by using real world examples, like, say, using Hitler as uh, a centerpiece for an evil character, uh, it's very of its time, like 100, 200 years ago, uh, or 200 years from now, rather, uh, the children are definitely going to still learn about uh, that time and how horrible it was, but it's not going to have the same impact because so much time has passed. Whereas the same story could draw parallels to other things that are happening, even tangentially. Mm. That's another, I think, another strong suit of fiction is you can, you can pretty much take real world events and you can just dress it up and distill it to its essence and just take that core of it. And that's, that's actually a very good technique, I think, for, for coming up with ideas <laughs> for stories. Well, there's even, um, I'm trying to think of it now. I think the author's name is Turtle Dove. Harry Turtle Dove, maybe? He, uh, he did a lot of, um, alternate history books. And, uh, I've read a couple of his there and just trying to see which one it was. It's been so long since I've read them, so just kind of hard but he he basically took uh world war Two and turned it into kind of like a, a fantasy type setting and oh, i see it was it's quite interesting yeah it was it was very interesting uh yeah it was uh darkness that's the series so into the darkness darkness descending and uh yeah it took a lot of elements from the uh, World War II series, but kind of injected that uh, fantasy into it. So it was very interesting. I should go back and read them. <laughs> yeah, I see Publishers Weekly called him the master of alternate history. Yeah. <laughs> and you know he's doing it well. And he wouldn't have gotten that if he just wrote a history book, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go. Fiction's take on a non-fiction foundation. Yeah. I'd say there's definitely a, a lot of merits to doing either one. Um, I don't think we could ever come to a consensus of which one is better. But uh, I think we can both agree pro probably that you should do what you feel you would be best at. Mm -hmm. so it's if, about contributing. Yeah. So if you feel that you have a story from your own life that... Uh, people would love to read about, about the human experience, that sort of thing, then go nonfiction, and maybe even you can use that as a platform to go to fiction. 
there's no artificial you know thing keeping you to the one or the other you could mix and match as much as you like mm -hmm. which is another advantage so uh viewers why don't you let us know what you think in the comments below there uh and just tell us if you prefer fiction non-fiction as far as reading or even if uh you would prefer writing fiction versus non-fiction And thank you for joining us here at Second Drafts Podcast. Uh, please be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on everything you need to write, edit, and publish your way. And let us know what you'd like to see from us in future podcasts. And we'll see you next time. Do you want to support production of this YouTube series? Visit www.patreon.com slash and become a patron today.